I am Lisa Viscusi. I'm the manager of adult learning at the Frick Pittsburgh, and I'm so glad to have you all here for this exciting, truly. Um, this was sort of the, the as soon as I knew about the show Sporting Fashion, um, the exhibition that we currently have that we're doing all this program uh, programming for, I really was excited to talk about Title IX. And boy, do we have the exact right people here. Um, so if everyone wants to join us, um, Heather, Nina, and Sue, please come on. Um, before we do anything, I would like to do a land acknowledgement. Um, the Frick occupies ancestral lands of the Haudenosaunee, Lenape, Osage, and Shawnee peoples. As a place of history and nature, the Frick recognizes the cultural importance of land and the role of cultural institutions in the formation of collective memory. Displacement and erasure are not just histories for Native peoples. Land acknowledgments, like historic sites themselves, are exercises in preservation and reconciliation engaged with past, present, and future. Um, hello, everyone. It's great to see you. I love seeing everybody's backgrounds. It's still one of my favorite parts of doing things online, um, though I can't believe we're still online, <laughs> but we're here we are. Uh, just a quick few notes for everyone here. Uh, you will see in one moment that the captions have been enabled. They're currently at the bottom of the screen and you are welcome to move them around if they um, impede your view in any way. You just hover over them with your mouse and then you can move them around the screen. Also, please feel free at any time to speak up to us in the chat. I see some people were telling me I'm muted. I appreciate that guys. Thank you so much. Um, and any comments you have during the program, Heather, you, you're, um, you're happy to have people comment during or ask questions. And if it's the right time to get to them, we will do it. And if we do not get to it, um, we have time at the end with uh, our Q&A session. So we will do our very best to, to respond to everything. But I have a feeling there's going to be a lot. Um, and before, again, before I throw it over to you, Heather, I do just want to say a few words. Uh, from myself, from the Frick. Um, I want to thank Heather Arne. There she is. Uh, she is the CEO of the Women and Girls Foundation here in Pittsburgh. And I just, we, we have entered into this incredible partnership with WGF and the Frick. And I want to say, Heather, working with you, your team, Natalie um, Bensavenga, who has been a great help in, in this partnership, it's just been wonderful for us and for me. Um, and when we were in early meetings about how we could all work together and bring exciting and relevant programming um, around this, this exhibition, Natalie said at one point, collaboration is the new competition, which I am going to put on a sweatshirt at some point. It's going to happen. Um, and it's really summed up, I think, in those words, my, my approach and our approach at the Frick to bringing people together, individuals, organizations, and communities through civic engagement and coming together to have these conversations about social history and modern movements and the ways in which everything around us intersects. So our current exhibition, Sporting Fashion Outdoor Girls from 1800 to 1960, brings to the public a visual a visual and historic narrative. There's an art, uh, as Sue, as you were saying, Sue saw the exhibition recently and, and explained exactly what I'm telling you, which is that it's this beautiful visual arc um, and historical narrative of women's place in the world through sporting ensembles. So we go from walking attire to bathing suits to shimmery roller derby uniforms. We, we see this happening. We take that turn. We didn't get to spandex, but we could talk about that later if you want, because that's where we are now. Um, <laughs> and so slowly over time, it shows how women began to seek empowerment for themselves in a society that sees them as second best. And by having conversations like this, we look beyond 1960 and listen to the stories of women who are still seeking uh, but more powerfully demanding that we have agency over our bodies and are celebrated and revered rather than tolerated and undervalued. So I really am so grateful for all three of you to be here today. Again, Heather, thank you. Nina, thank you. Sue, thank you. Uh, it's an honor to have the three of you here and I look forward to learning from each one of you. So I'm going to turn it over to Heather Arne now and I'm going to fade, but I will be here for moral support. Thank you everyone for being here with us. 
Well, thank you, Lisa. And, uh, and really thank you to the whole Frick team. It's been a pleasure collaborating with you all. And, uh, and good evening, everyone else who's with us this evening, or if you're watching tomorrow or the next day, uh, hello to you tomorrow as well. Uh, but good evening and welcome to this conversation about the legacy of Title IX, which has been inspired by the sporting fashion exhibit at Frick Pittsburgh. And um, as Lisa said, when viewing the exhibit, which is fantastic, by the way, we definitely encourage you to visit it if you can. Um, and when viewing the exhibit, one really cannot help but think about the beauty and complexity of the clothing and also the inequities that the female athletes must have struggled with as they were so often hampered and encumbered by clothing that so clearly was totally inappropriate to the sport they were engaged in at the time. And that is why the Women and Girls Foundation wanted to also uh, use these uh, public panels and uh, programs as an opportunity for public engagement and discourse to discuss advances in gender equity in sports over time and current inequities and struggles that are still happening right now for continued advancement for rights and opportunities. And, um, and I also just cannot think of two other more wonderful people to be having this conversation with. We are so, uh, so lucky to have them both here this evening. So our guests are uh, Nina Chandri, uh, the general counsel and senior advisor for Education and National Women's Law Center, and Sue Fritchie, the founder and director of the Western PA Office for the Women's Law Project. And, um, uh, and I'm... Uh, Certainly, they can both feel free to tell you more about their bios, um, but we have such short amount of time, I kind of want to jump into the conversation if that's all right. Um, you should all know, actually, that, that both of these women are incredible attorneys and legal experts are actually both experts in national, state, and local law when it comes to Title IX. Uh, tonight, I'm, I'm going to try to, to keep some some of various questions focused at the national level for you, Nina, and more at the state and local level for you, Sue, because that's where your work right now has you. But you should all know here in Pennsylvania that our brilliant Sue Fritchie has argued at the Supreme Court, and you know, she knows what she knows what she's talking about at all levels too. Uh, and uh, and I know Nina would be fighting here in the trenches with us, the grassroots as well. So. Um, knowing you could you could both answer all these questions. Uh, hopefully we can also just enjoy a really in-depth dialogue. Um, I thought first, uh, just for, uh, I'm not going to talk a lot, but I just thought um, for folks at home who, you know, you, they hear Title IX a lot and might not um, actually know what that means. Um, so just want to remind folks that Title IX is a federal civil rights law in the United States of America that was passed as part of the education amendments of 1972, and it prohibits sex-based discrimination in any school or other education program that receives federal funding. And um, folks might find it interesting to know that Title IX was enacted as follow-up to the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and I won't get into all the legal complexities, but what's especially important to know is that law did not include, uh, did not prohibit sex discrimination against persons employed at educational institutions. And that's particularly where Title IX came into play. And, um, and feminists felt it was, a, it was important in the 1970s to lobby Congress to add sex as a protected class category uh, for those who are employed in educational institutions. Um, I wanted to just add this little part because I think sometimes folks think that Title IX is actually just about sports. <laughs> um, and actually it's really about civil rights, particularly around um, sex, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but was not sports specific. Uh, that being said, Nina, I will pass the first question to you to maybe talk about like, how is it do you think that this, this this amendment, this Title IX law, has become so intrinsically connected, especially in the popular imagination, to athletics. 
Yeah, well, let me first start by saying thank you um, for having us for this great discussion. I really hope I can get up to see the exhibit. It sounds uh, pretty awesome. Um, and just to reiterate something Heather said, um, you know, Title IX applies broadly to educational programs and activities, and that includes sports for sure, but it also includes things like sexual harassment and pregnant and parenting students and single sex education. And so when you think of Title IX, it really is the breadth of educational programs and activities. Um, and interestingly, sports wasn't mentioned, you know, when Title IX was passed, it didn't really become sort of a contentious subject until the regulations uh, came out several years later. And in fact, uh, the National Women's Law Center uh, was involved from the very beginning. Our founder, Marsha Greenberger, uh, you know, helped shape the law over the decades that she worked at the Law Center. And we ended up suing to get the Department of then Health, Education and Welfare to actually issue regulations. Um, but I think, you know, from the very beginning, it, it became very contentious. Uh, the way I sort of was told, you know, the story, I wasn't working on it just yet, um, is that, you know, when people figured out it would apply to sports, then of course the, the conversation was, oh my God, what about football? But we, we can't have, you know, girls taking away opportunities from our football players. Um, and so then it became, you know, sort of the most talked about thing um, in, in Title IX, and there were all kinds of amendments that tried uh, members of Congress tried to pass to exempt, you know, revenue producing sports. And um, it was a big fight to really get the regulations and, and the policies that followed uh, to really apply equally um, to women and girls. And, and I think one of the reasons it is sort of synonymous now with Title IX, right, is it really just broke down those barriers. I mean, since Title IX, we've had an explosion of women play at the college level, at the high school level, you know, from under 300,000 at the high school level girls to like over 3.5 million now. Um, so I think once that happened and started happening, you know, people saw the real effect that the law had um, on those opportunities for girls and women. Yeah, absolutely. And it's such a good reminder of how the National Women's Law Center was so um, involved in this law from the beginning. And so, Sue, you know, Women's Law Project here in Pennsylvania has been involved in some pretty high profile cases to do exactly as Dina has just described, really um, advocate for equal opportunities, particularly at the university level. Although also I happen to know <laughs> at some uh, more uh, elementary, middle and high school levels as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit about those cases? Oh, sure. And um, I just have to note that none of the Women's Law Project's work uh, would be possible without the ground that the National Women's Law Center laid. And we still rely on you all the time uh, for your expertise and your incomparable uh, policy knowledge, and it's just a lovely collaboration. So it is a great honor to be here with you, Nina. Uh, back at um, so. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, you know, we've worked on athletics at the collegiate and high school, junior high, and even elementary school level um, since our Western Pennsylvania office opened in 2002. And, um, you know, my one frustration with this work is that we haven't done even more than we've done because one of the flaws in our legal system is that it places on the victim the weight and the responsibility and the duty of coming forward to enforce their rights and make there be justice. And that's a heavy weight to put on a sixth grader. You know, um, so uh, I guess the first case that comes to mind is the amazing Charlotte Murphy, who was barely more than that when she challenged Pittsburgh Public Schools' terrible decision to end girls basketball because it was just too much trouble, I suppose. Oh. Um, and they eliminated Charlotte's team and she got upset about it and asked her mother, what can I, what are you going to do about it, mom? And her mother said, <laughs> no, what are you going to do about it? And this little girl found herself um, a bright pink power suit and sat down and met with the head of Pittsburgh Public Schools and talked to her about why 
having a girls basketball team was important for her and why it was unfair that the boys got one and she didn't. And with very little coaching from the Women's Law Project, I must say, this kid got a gender equitable basketball uh, league formed at Pittsburgh Public Schools that was more vibrant than ever before. She saved basketball for the girls and she expanded it for the boys which raises a really kind of important point, which is it's not really a, a zero sum game. Girls gaining athletic opportunities, that does not mean that boys are gonna lose athletic opportunities. And historically it has been true that boys and men's teams have, have grown um, in the years since Title IX. Um, that was such, an exciting and inspiring victory because it came so much from the heart of the students who were affected by it. And um, it, that was the same case in a college case that we brought um, a few years previously. Uh, we sued Slippery Rock University in Western Pennsylvania uh, at the point at which they eliminated their women's swimming, water polo, and field hockey teams. And uh, Nina, I don't know if you've noticed this uh, also, but uh, for us, people come to us to ask for help with the Title IX problem in athletics at the point at which their team has been eliminated and usually not before, even if tr the treatment issues are egregious, even if the girls or women's teams are not being treated well at all. Um, it's the point at which they actually have lost their team, that that is the last straw and they reach out for legal help. And um, we were able to uh, stop the university from eliminating those teams, though I have to say that was short lived. We kept the field hockey team but the school was permitted to dissolve the aquatics teams uh, because they were able to show that um, they had met their participation requirement by elevating the girls lacrosse team to a varsity sport. So the bittersweet ending to that story was that we won in a way. However, uh, the young women who brought that litigation and carried the burden of it ended up losing their team after all. They did, however, get $300,000 in um, additional money for girls sports and many, many, many improvements. Well, and your point, Sue, about the burden of proof and, and the work being placed on the victim, I think is such a crucial one, especially going back to Nina's point about how Title IX also applies to sexual harassment and abuse and misconduct and so, and many ways. And certainly I think it's impossible for any of us today to be even having this conversation without thinking about the athletes, the brave athletes this morning, giving testimony against Nasser. And so many of those abuses happened within an educational situation. Um, and so Nina, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, when Title IX has been um, used I would say in some ways, like the use and abuse of Title IX, we, we saw sort of I, almost an abuse of Title IX, perhaps under the Davos administration or attempts thereof, it seemed. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, how, how just so that folks have a sense of how, how does Title IX apply in, in that regard around um, protecting folks around sexual assault, though, of course, it, again, um, with uh, victims perhaps having that burden on them still? Yeah, sure. So, you know, Title IX prohibits um, sexual harassment and as a form of sex discrimination. And until the late 90s, actually, when uh, the law center represented a fifth grade girl in the Supreme Court, uh, the courts were all over the place about whether schools had a responsibility, essentially, and could be liable for failing to address uh, sexual harassment, either by a teacher against a student or a student against a student. And I was a baby lawyer when I started at the Law Center and was lucky enough to work a little bit on the Supreme Court case called Davis versus Monroe County Board of Education, where this fifth grader 
uh, out of Georgia um, was basically being harassed by a, a classmate, you know, every day for months on end, just kind of, you know, being rubbed up against and um, other sort of inappropriate touching. And uh, she told her teachers, she told the principal, her mother told the principal, and they refused to do even the simplest thing, um, you know, like move her homeroom seat away from this other boy. And she, her grades dropped and she ended up writing a suicide note. And um, they brought a case, you know, as Sue was saying, it's often when people are at the end of their rope, really, that they, they bring their case um, and they, they've tried to, to get relief from their schools. And they brought it pro se, they brought it on their own. And we found out about it, I think, at the 11th Circuit level. And anyway, to make a long story short, we represented this young woman in the Supreme Court in 1999 and got a decision out of the Supreme Court that was mostly good in that it said, you know, Title IX does require schools to take action. Um, but the liability standard for schools uh, when you sue for money damages is very high. It's, it's much higher than you and I would face in the workplace even, so that adults are essentially more protected than kids are in school. So that was disappointing. Um, and since then, though, you know, there have been a series of guidances and policies over the years from the Department of Education, and, and they've all been fairly consistent um, in saying, you know, look, when a school, when there's um, an allegation of some, any sort of harassment or assault, uh, and a school knows about it, they need to do something, they need to quickly investigate, they need to figure out what happened and, and take some corrective action, right, and protect that student and, and really eliminate the sort of hostile educational environment so that kids can keep learning. Um, and until, you know, uh, 2016 and, and um, the Trump administration, things were at least moving in that direction. And we had amazing young women at the, the higher education level who really stepped up their advocacy and, and um, helped produce just really strong guidance in the Obama years um, that really made clear what, what schools had to do. And then Betsy DeVos came along and in May 2020 uh, announced a final rule, a new rule that really weakened protections against sexual harassment in schools, um, including sexual assault. And I won't get into all the details, but suffice it to say that you know, it, she made it harder for sexual harassment victims to come forward, um, increasing sort of the burden on them, uh, made it so that schools could basically ignore victims in many instances when they asked for help, and uh, really stacked the deck in terms of the processes and rules against, you know, students coming forward. So uh, many of us, you know, were, were really upset by this, and we at the Law Center and, and many other groups uh, sued the department um, and we, not that long ago, got a partial win out of the uh, judge in the First Circuit in Massachusetts, um, a district court judge, basically vacated one provision of the rule, which had to do with um, excluding evidence if the person who, you know, provided the evidence didn't testify under to cross-examination and to subject themselves to cross-examination at a live hearing. And remember, we're talking about, you know, this applies from like elementary school all the way up. So the idea that um, you had to submit to cross-examination potentially by your harasser or abuser um, in order for any statements that you make to be, you know, considered as evidence um, was really ridiculous and making it, you know, like into a courtroom. And so the judge understood that and vacated that piece. And so, you know, we're now in a position where we have a more favorable administration um, who does understand these issues. And we are really hoping that they will be coming out with a new Title IX rule um, soon so that uh, schools can get back on track because, um, you know, this was a problem that for years was swept under the rug and we were finally making progress. And then Betsy DeVos decided that it was unfair to those accused of, of sexual harassment and we needed to you know, weaken the rules significantly. I know. Thank you so much for going into that detail, because I think it is so helpful and important for folks to understand how even something that feels like it should be firm can become so malleable, depending on the administration. It's also part of why voting matters and, yep. um, and why organizations like both of yours, National Women's Law Center and Women's Law Project, in case anyone listening wants to bring out their checkbook or credit card and go mm -hmm. online and make a donation to these very valuable organizations that help protect our rights and opportunities. Um, but truly, I mean, I don't see that in jest. Like these, these, these rights and opportunities that we have are, are never uh, stagnant, right? <laughs> they seem to always be moving uh, uh, when we talk about rights and opportunities, especially 
it seems for women, girls, and marginalized communities. And I think that will bring me to my next question, which is, you know, Sue, it feels especially like one of the ways that Title IX has, is being um, used and manipulated most recently is around um, transgender athletes' rights. And um, especially at the state level, not to say that there aren't going to be attempts in, around the federal level, but it seems like our state legislatures seem like um, really um, a media target um, for those and, and school boards. So, you know, certainly um, for attorneys like yourself, women's law projects who especially work at the local and state level, I wondered what you could share with us around your thoughts around, it seems, you know, even just as a lay person, not a lawyer, that, you know, at, during the recent Trump administration, at one point, they were trying to say that Title IX was protecting cisgendered uh, athletes from competing with transgender athletes. And of course, there are others of us who are hoping that Title IX can be used to protect all athletes' rights from, from discrimination of all forms. So, um, so, so can you talk with us a little bit about what's going on with Title IX in this regard? Sure. Um, so um, some years ago now, uh, we represented a group called the Rainbow Alliance at the University of Pittsburgh, who brought litigation against the university uh, because for a little while, the university had a very strange policy um, that required trans students to show a birth certificate in order to use a restroom consistent with their gender identity. That is not the case now, um, but at the time it was in vi clear violation of uh, the Pittsburgh Fair Practices Ordinance, which explicitly protects against discrimination against LGBT people, including trans people um, in public accommodations and in education. Um, so that is now a thing of the past, but the kind of uh, animus, I guess, that, that motivated that crazy policy to begin with is not a thing of the past. And right now in Harrisburg in our state capital, like in other state capitals, we have a movement to ban trans students from uh, sports teams that are consistent with their gender identity. Um, and our bill is called House Bill 972. And um, get this, it's called the, uh, <laughs> They call it the Fairness in Women's Sports Act. They're always and, really good at naming things. I know. Yeah, and the point. idea is that if you let a trans student onto a girl's sports team, they're going to be such incredible, like powerhouses, that they are going to crush the female athletes who will have no capacity to, uh, to compete. So it's absolutely based on these very deep and really uh, kind of insulting gender stereotypes, a lot of ignorance about female athletes who are quite powerful, uh, <laughs> um, a lack of familiarity with the reality of um, trans athletes participation in high school and college sports where they have not actually destroyed girl sports. And what bothers me, I'm, I'm bothered by this for so many reasons and on so many levels. It is just so mean. And it was not motivated by anybody having an actual problem. This was pure, divisive, mean-hearted politics at its absolute worst. And that's all it was. Nobody was complaining about this as any kind of problem at all. In fact, there is a problem. The problem is that trans students are subject to much higher rates of uh, harassment and abuse. They uh, are, have a much higher suicide and attempted suicide rate. And if anything, that's the classification that needs extra protection, not extra oppression. Um, but what 
the other thing that just really kills me about this so-called fairness in uh, Fairness in Women's Sports Act is that we looked at the sponsors of this bill and there are five state representatives. And we looked at the high schools in their districts and guess what? No, the no, public no. high schools in the districts of these so-called big supporters of women's sports are not actually all in compliance with equitable participation under Title IX. They've got some big gaps there. And what I mean by that is their athletic program is skewed very strongly towards male sports to the detriment of the girls in those high schools. So the girls aren't being given enough opportunities. They're not being given enough coaching, enough training, enough publicity, uh, enough facilities, equipment, supplies, uniforms, none of that. And if you actually cared about improving girls' sports and women's sports, isn't that the first thing that you would look at? Yeah, I just want to add, I absolutely agree with everything Sue has said. And I just wanted to make a couple additional points, which is, you know, there was a recent Supreme Court case uh, where the Supreme Court made very clear that sex discrimination includes discrimination on the basis of gender identity and sexual um, orientation, but for this purpose, in particular, gender identity. And Title IX, of course, prohibits sex discrimination. So courts are already starting to find, um, and the Department of Ed has, and the Department of Justice, you know, this administration has said that, of course, Title IX protects the right of transgender students to access school programs which, and facilities, which includes athletics. Um, and as Sue said, this is this has been, you know, trans students have been playing sports for a long time. There are athletic associations in, you know, about half the states that already allow for full participation. The NCAA has had a rule on the books for decades. Um, this is not new. It is clearly a wedge issue that has become very popular right now um, and is being, you know, used in the political game. But I also just want to make a point that, you know, this pitting uh, trans women in particular, because most of the cases are about trans women and girls, right, against um, cis women and girls, and, and policing who is female or isn't female is dangerous for all of us. Um, it doesn't only erect barriers for transgender athletes who want to compete consistent with their gender identity, but also for cisgender women who may fall outside of the stereotypical notions of femininity, right? Um, what if you're very tall? What if you're very muscular? Um, or you choose to present in more masculine ways? You know, there are a lot of these laws could force women, trans or cis, to undergo medical testing, or you could be prevented from playing sports entirely. Um, and then when you look in particular at black and brown women and girls who are especially vulnerable to this sort of scrutiny, given the racist and sexist stereotypes that are out there that consider their bodies less feminine, this is a real problem for all of us. Um, and so I think we need to resist the, the efforts to divide us, um, recognize what the law says and what's right, um, and not prohibit you know, or um, discriminate against trans students in any of these ways. Absolutely. And Nina, now that there are these fit where the federal law is, get, is getting clearer, um, are there ways that for folks in states like ours, where there are efforts to inhibit rights and opportunities, um, and really rights, <laughs> just basic civil rights for folks at the state level, um, well, we could go on about that, but yeah. that's a whole other story. Um, but in this case, we are talking about athletics, so we'll stay on that topic for today. Um, but are there things that folks in Pennsylvania can be doing um, to make sure that state bills aren't um, <laughs> passed that conflict with federal law? What's your advice here? Um, yeah, that's a good question. And Sue, I'd really love your input because you're obviously at the state level. I mean, I will say we have weighed in whenever we can be helpful. You know, there was an Idaho bill and um, we weighed in as a friend of the court briefs. I mean, we are weighing in whenever we can partner with our state allies and it's helpful for us to do so. But yeah, I mean, I think it's much harder at the state level, right? Because depending on um, what, the law, what the law is, some are more draconian than others. Um, 
it can be tough to, to figure out how to, you know, defeat them. I mean, obviously all the normal sort of ways you try to, you know, defeat bad legislation come into play. Well, we've already had federal litigation brought by anti-trans um, activists alleging mm. that Title IX uh, meant that you had to keep trans students out of right. restrooms appropriate for their gender. Oh. And we won that one. Yeah. yeah, We've already won that one. And the yeah. law is going in the right direction in that area since then. But we still yeah. have the state legislature. And when I think about that, um, I have to say that there is one backstop mm -hmm. that we better hang on to. Yeah. And that is the governor's veto pen. So no matter how bad our state legislature is, and I don't mean to paint them all with the same brush, there are excellent, excellent legislators in that body. Unfortunately, the majority seem not to be. Um, but no matter how bad the majority gets, as long as we have a governor uh, who understands uh, human rights, and women's rights and is willing to exercise his veto authority, we have some protection. Or her. Um, even apart okay. from the court system, you know? Um, so that, uh, that governor's chair is gonna be empty next year and people better keep that in mind when they go to vote. Indeed. Uh, well said. And <laughs> I know the, the Frick folks as, as a, um, private museum, nonprofit entity, et cetera. Um, I know that they um, you know, aren't very involved in politics, but everybody can be involved as a constituent in communicating to whoever their legislator is about how you feel about these issues. And so um, if you're watching tonight or tomorrow um, and you care deeply about um, all athletes having civil rights and freedom to play sports, uh, then that is an important thing to communicate, especially to your Pennsylvania legislators. I see Lisa's joining us, so that means that we probably have some questions in the chat. So Lisa, you certainly feel free to unmute yourself and appear magically if, if we have questions. Um, uh, and, and do we? Other? I, there, are, there is one so far. Yeah. Oh, actually it is um, it's not a question. Um, but now is the time. Now is the time. Now is the time. You have these ask questions. amazing minds here um, uh, to ask said, some questions to. Sue I might have, have a question. Say again? Uh, I said Sue might have a question. I do have another oh, Sue, question. Sue, do you have a question? Your hand's raised. Sue first. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, how do I operate this thing? Oh, I'm sorry doing, about that. However, since I have the floor, <laughs> oh, um, right. I, can't, <laughs> I can't help. But um, take the opportunity to ask Nina um, whether she thinks there's any chance of moving the Biden administration to um, revoke the DeVos sexual harassment regulations and uh, repromulgate better ones before May of next year. Oh, before May of next year. I don't know about that. I mean, I definitely think, you know, they're, they've said they're looking at, um, you know, and we'll, we'll issue something. So we are certainly pushing and we welcome everybody's help in pushing them to do it as soon as possible. I mean, I get that it is, um, you know, it's a very large rule and they need to jump through all the hoops and cross their T's and dot their I's. But yes, we are certainly hopeful. Well, thank you for your work on that. Thank you for all the support. And I see a comment by Amanda in the chat about how she keeps thinking about how so many restrictions on women historically are because of perceived or feared outcomes anticipated by men rather than by anything that's actually happening. And, and so many of them really are also right connected to this it, um, uh, interest in controlling, right? Controlling women's bodies. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, and certainly it, in this issue that we were just talking about, there's there's this intersection of sexism and and homophobia and racism, uh, all all intersecting together at this uh, and you and these are not uh, accidents. 
Um, and it feels like it's not an accident that we're seeing state legislatures uh, considering legislation that's restricting women's reproductive health access, uh, you know, and putting more control over women's bodies in that way. And also then trying to even talk about how um, women can compete athletically with one another, um, all women, cis women, trans women, um, you know, and, uh, and, you know, these, these are, these do all feel like efforts to control um, uh, women's bodies and women's futures. Um, and it's interesting because in some ways, Amanda and Lisa, that does make me think about the exhibit again, because so many of the, when you look at those athletic costumes, I have a theater background, so I always call them <laughs> costumes, <laughs> you know, that they're uniforms, but, um, you know, there's a lot of restriction, either, um, you know, thinking about a lot of the, the outfits at the very beginning, you, you know, were basically created because of male gaze, either how they needed to cover their bodies, how they needed to look, despite um, it was not about like how they needed to play or access to their body as an athlete. Um, and, and that seems to be still playing out today. Um, you know, we, ha we yes. have just a little bit of more time and I was thinking about, you know, um, we can all remember just a few years back when the national women's soccer team, you know, had this tremendous victory, huge goal, you know, this tremendous moment. A soccer player took off her shirt, you know, in victory. Of course, she had a sports bra underneath it, which is more than the volleyball players are wearing, you know, down at the Olympic court down the street. But, you know, there was this huge uproar in the press about whether she had like a right to you know, expose her shoulders and navel on the soccer field, you know, and this, and it, it really, I think we still have this interest in controlling female athlete bodies um, and deciding what they can and cannot wear on the field um, and how interesting that was. I don't know if these are Title IX issues, Nina and Sue, issues around, um, dress, but I know like recently we've heard, we saw about the Olympics, the volleyball um, athletes and other runners and, and just different folks. I thought it just felt like athletes taking more control and voicing more of their own agency and what they could wear. Um, I open the floor to both of you on that. Well, I will just say that, you know, it's interesting that you're raising this question about sort of dress. And I know in schools for dress code purposes, we've done a lot of work um, about, you know, discriminatory dress codes and had a lot of success. We have a number of resources on our website if folks are interested, um, because, yeah, when you have discriminatory dress codes that say, you know, girls can't wear something that, you know, boys can wear, or we've had situations where we've represented young black females who, you know, are being told, sent to the principal's office or whatever, because they're wearing a tank top that a white girl's wearing with no problem. Mm -hmm. um, those are real issues. And some of those are intersectional issues as we were talking about of race and sex, um, but they are definitely issues that we have uh, been, you know, challenging under Title IX and, and with some success. So, um, I think, you know, similarly for athletes, yeah, it's just, you're right that it is so much about, you know, control over women's bodies, policing women's bodies. Um, and I think still sports is a very controversial area where there does seem to be this like threatening, you know, atmosphere where women are still um, stereotyped as not really being, you know, <clears throat> fit for, for sports in many ways, right? That it's just like sort of an afterthought, like, oh yeah, let's let them play. But, you know, not really recognizing their power and their strength and their um, abilities. And that, I think it's a real cultural phenomenon that we still have work to do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you think about where we came from um, and how women's maternal role uh, was kind of so used against us. It's such a powerful thing mm. and it was turned into a source of weakness. So women couldn't go out of the house. They couldn't work at difficult jobs. They couldn't, they couldn't do really much of anything because doing so would sap energy from their reproductive organs and interfere with their maternal capacity, right? So that's what we're coming from. That's yeah. the mythology that we're recovering from. Uh, and I don't think we've quite recovered from it yet. Yeah, absolutely. And yet the, the great irony for 
for anyone who's had to go through childbirth itself is that <laughs> that in of itself, if anybody ever doubted the physical prowess, strength, or vigor yeah, of, try having of a someone with those with that biological makeup, you know, you just have to go through that experience yourself to, go, to realize it's really quite quite an athletic experience. Um, <laughs> um, Do you want me? There's a comment or. Yes, I see. Here. Has a, yes, yeah. please. Yes. Um, so she is bringing up the discussion on trans athletes in schools. Um, the reality of the issues, as discussed, is just rarely, if ever, presented in mainstream media. Um, I had to put real some real effort into getting basic information. This event has been really helpful. Thank you. Uh, the question what kind of public relations or educational efforts are going on that some of us could help with and participate in? I was gonna ask a similar question, so thank you for that. That's a great question. So what's yeah. next? What can, what can we actually do? Um, what we, we know what you're doing, it's incredible. I mean, you keep doing that, <laughs> but yeah. This is a great question. Um, thank you, Philomena. It's a great question, especially because like Nina, you mentioned, you know, at the federal level, we have this important, you know, law that says, you know, you can't discriminate against folks. These, these, and so um, are there um, educational efforts, um, public information uh, that folks have access to? Can they go to your website and get information um, so that they can help distribute that share information and knowledge with others. Yeah, definitely. And I also think in particular, the ACLU um, has been doing terrific work representing so many uh, trans students, um, you know, groups like GLSEN and um, there are several groups out there, you know, that have been doing this work and HRC uh, and of course, you know, all of our um, just Title IX affiliates and partners on the ground like Sue and the Women's Law Project. I mean, I think also really like we were talking about earlier, getting in touch with your members of Congress wherever you are and telling them how you feel and how you don't want anti-trans legislation. Um, I mean, you know, they're supposed to answer to we the people uh, and they need to hear from us because there are so many bad bills out there uh, that I think if we could, you know, do that work to really try to, weigh in with our voices, um, maybe we can collectively try to stop some of these from coming forward, um, because it's always better to try to do it on that end, right? But if we have to sue, then we're relying on, you know, whatever court we happen to be in. And I'd just like to add to that, um, this is not as daunting as you might be thinking. So look at House Bill 972. This is in our state legislature. If you're in Pennsylvania, right? We have 253 state legislators. It's an enormous legislature. And so each state house district is not that big. If they get 10 letters on one topic, <laughs> that legislator sits up and takes notice and starts getting nervous. Get 10 letters. That's what you do, get 10 letters. Right. And, you know, everybody can find 10 friends who mm -hmm. are offended by House Bill 972. Go out and do it. Like, I want to kill that bill. I don't want the governor to have to veto it. We want right. to just kill that bill. And so, Sue, is there information on your website? There about is, yes. That? We have, so that, um, I know that folks will watch this and then they'll say, I remember something about yeah. the bill, but I don't remember the bill number. Or, you yeah. know, yeah, I just feel like I need a little bit more information before I write that email to my legislator. So please um, go to womenslawproject.org and look at our blog. Uh, you can sign up for it and it will come to your inbox. And um, Great, thank that you. will give you all the background you need on this and many other issues. And Nina, can you also say the web address for National Women's Law, Law Center? Sure, it's www.nwlc.org. And yeah, we have some um, very simple fact sheets also on you know trans uh, athletes. Um, oh, the Women's Sports Foundation also. I totally forgot. Yeah. To mention. They have a ton of great stuff. So there is stuff out there. I hear you that it's not as easy to find. And of course, you know, there's a lot of um, anti-trans stuff out there. But uh, people are you know fighting for for civil rights, and uh, we need all the help we can get. So we really appreciate anything that any folks can do.
Yeah, Nina, I see that you, oh, sorry. <laughs> I see that you gave um, a suggestion to someone asked in the in Q&A, um, yeah. but I'm gonna read this if you don't mind. Sure. Um, someone has asked, uh, some or, or commented, some people are concerned about the muscle mass that some trans students may have naturally over other non-trans students. Are there some articles you can suggest to read more about this topic concern? Um, for uh, i.e. strength advantage. And Nina said, check out work by Katrina Carcasis. Is that is that right? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's other stuff out there too, but that's just one I, I know off the top of my head and I'm, I'm pretty sure she has some really good stuff, so. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you, Lisa. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, can you put that in the chat? So I would love to put it in the chat for you. That's fantastic. Um, Philomena says there is lots of anti-trans stuff out there. There is. They are very well financed. Um, uh, that is true. That is but true. I'm so glad that we have these resources laid out for you here. I am definitely a big fan girl of the three organizations that are in the chat right now, Women's Law Project, National Women's Law Center, and the Women's Sports Foundation. All three of those websites have sections, particularly on the, on the issues we've talked about this evening. Um, so you will find lots of good resources there. And Heather, um, what resources can people find on your website? Well, you know, it's funny. I mean, we do have information on our website at Women and Girls Foundation, but I would say we're much more active on social media these days than okay. we are on our website. So I would say folks should follow us at WGFPA on Instagram and on Facebook uh, and on Twitter. Uh, we're probably more guilty of not posting a lot on our website and uh, doing a lot more on social media. Um, we have our disruptor series. Uh, actually, I was what I was doing right before I came here, 6 p.m. live uh, on Instagram every Thursday at WGFPA. I was just interviewing someone Sue and I know really well, Monica Ruiz, the executive director of Casa San Jose, who's an amazing activist in our community. Um, and, uh, and so every week we interview a disruptor, um, usually here in Pennsylvania, but also nationally, people working nationally, uh, doing all sorts of stuff uh, in politics, in the arts. Um, so, yeah. I think that as you're saying that I'm, you know, I always end up at the end of every program or anything I attend, I think, what can we do or what can I do or how do I, how do I take this with me everywhere? And I think exactly what Heather's saying, which is the disruptors, things like the disruptor series, you know, re, I, there are some, I saw some articles by Nina, there are videos of our esteemed panelists um, tell, talking about the things that they know and that we can learn from. And so just try, I think I have to remind myself to stay plugged in because if you stay plugged in somehow you can just, you sort of keep going on the the shoulders of other women and other you know colleagues and um, so I would recommend let's check Heather out every Thursday because you're going to be introduced to some it's sort of like watching the the tree grow watching the network expand um, and then you learn about issues you you figure out how to find people like Nina and Sue and Heather who can help us um, really continue to support one another and to, to, to care for ourselves, um, in particular, these issues, women's issues. So I will just say that my plug for you all. Uh, yeah. Very yeah. I, and I will just say one thing. I mean, you know, broadly on the women's sports issue, as Sue started out saying, so much of the burden is on, you know, the students, the parents, you know, I've worked with high schoolers who've come forward um, and pointed out inequities and I've worked with them to get, you know, settlements with their high schools. And it's, it's unfortunate that the burden's on them, but at the same time, I think it's a real opportunity for all of us, you know, our, our kids' schools, our, you know, family members, anybody, nieces, nephews, if you see something that doesn't seem right, you know, we can make a difference. I mean, 
raise your voice, talk to the principal now with social media. I mean, look what happened with the NCAA Women's Basketball Championship, right? The players are so, um, such activists themselves. And by posting that, they really exposed what we've all known has been going on forever. Um, but now we can see it. We can see the pathetic gym that they- That you know, yoga not even mat, that one single yoga mat. Right, like, it was ridiculous. And so, you know, we can all through our platforms put pressure on our local schools or, you know, the NCAA or whatever it is, our colleges, um, when we see these inequities and we can call them out. Uh, and often that is enough to spur some change. It may not fix everything right away, but it does slowly move that ball forward. Um, and so I think there's great power in that. Absolutely. And for the most part, when we fight, we win. When we fight, we win. I'm putting that on a sweatshirt also. Yeah. No, <laughs> when we fight, we win. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. We used to have a tagline about the law being on our side. And it's true because the law is so clear, especially Title IX in so many of these areas, right? So that, and the, the disparities are so gross that like when they are brought forward, yeah, we win. It's not, it's not that it's, you know, most of this is not that legally difficult. I mean, courts are sometimes difficult, but you know, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah the yeah. things that we're fighting for often. Yeah. And such an exciting time for folks to use their voice too. And mm -hmm. there's so many tools to do it. So, yep. well, I wanna thank, thank both of our guests for joining us this evening. Nina, Sue, what a joy and pleasure. It's, you know, so exciting to be with you in, in digital space. <laughs> thank you for giving um, some of your time this evening. Lisa and Amanda, Amanda behind the screen. Uh, truly, thank you to the Frick. You know, it's it's wonderful to have um, cultural institutions that will partner with us and have courageous conversations. Uh, and um, and you truly have been a wonderful partner, uh, especially over these last few months, as uh, as we've all been trying so dearly and. Um, critically uh, to engage in our community in real ways, even while we've had to do so in the safest ways possible. Um, so thank you. And thank, yes, again, thank you to everyone, all, all of you. Um, I'm always sort of like dumbstruck at the end of a program when I see what you're willing to share and, and you're willing to be vulnerable and open about your work. It's just, um, it's. I don't know. And we're lucky that we have the space to do it. We're, we're just, this is great. So thank you to everyone. It's been a pleasure. And I hope that we work together again, somehow we cross paths another way. Um, Heather. Yes. And Lisa, do we have one more panel coming up or did the third panel already happen? I've lost it. Track. It already happened. Yeah. We, it already the happened. Frick, all the right. Frick has other panels coming. So no, just all, come right. to all we of have them. so much. We, uh, have, we have three <laughs> wonderful panels. Yes. And, and if you haven't seen the show yet, please come. Um, if you aren't able to see the show, there are resources online on our website and um, on our YouTube pay, uh, channel. Um, and just keep, keep, Keep listening for, for, for what's out there. We will be here. I promise we will be here doing the work. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you to each of you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Yeah. Everyone have a thank good you. evening. Thank you for being yeah. with us. Thanks. Good night. Good thank night. you to everyone for your comments too. Yeah. Yeah. I see some old friends here too, Philomena. She's been with us through the pandemic from, from Massachusetts, I wanna say. Bye.